All right, everyone, we're, we are back again for our uh, next speaker. And uh, we have uh, Dr. Christman is a pediatrician and adolescent med medicine specialist. And her research is focused on sports-related concussion. She's completed her undergraduate in medical training at the University of Pennsylvania in, in Philadelphia and moved to Seattle in 2003 for a pediatric res residency at Seattle Children's Hospital and completed a fellowship in adolescent medicine and additional training in pediatric pain. She also obtained a master's in public health at the University of Washington and is now a physician and clinical researcher in adolescent medicine and sees patients with all types of adolescent issues, but is partic particularly interested in behavioral health she conducts research on the relationship between the brain and behavior, primarily regarding concussive injury. And today she's going to be talking to us about return to learn. And I think that's a great um, segue from our last session um, as uh, that uh, part of that uh, re rehabilitation part includes that. And so um, we are glad to uh, hear from you, Dr. Chrisman. Well, thank you for that introduction. It's uh, great to be here. Um, I'm, a, as you described, I'm a pediatrician. I'm a specialist in adolescent medicine, and, and I'm privileged to do research in kind of a, a cross-cut of places. And so I spend some time at the Harborview Injury Prevention Research Center. I also work at Children's Research Center. And I'm going to sort of shift with what you've been hearing today. So I know you've been hearing a lot about general brain injury, which covers mild, moderate, severe. And I'm really going to switch to talking more about concussion. And I think Dr. Herring's talk after mine will follow in that. And so you're going to, you sort of want to hear first about how concussion relates to academics, and then you're going to hear more about concussion and returning to sport. Um, and so the, the title of my talk is Return to Learn, which is a, a sort of phrase that came after return to play. And so uh, return to play was this idea of after a concussion, how do, you, how do you slowly return an athlete back to sport in a safe way? And return to learn is, is that with academics. and um, Oops, there we go. So as a, as a pediatrician, you know, I've, I've covered football and, and this is sort of the athlete that you see on the sideline. This is a kid who has a concussion and he's now, he's on the sideline, he's got his helmet off, he's not going back into the game. And, but one of the things that I think about is the same kid is also this kid. And this is also a kid that he has to go back to school. And so it used to be um, that this wasn't really thought about. And that's why I think this is an important thing to talk about. You've heard from, you know, Dr. Fuentes, where she's talking more about those kids with severe brain injury. And oftentimes they, it is recognized if you have a more severe brain injury, that it's going to be harder to go back to school. But for kids with concussion, that's only been kind of a recent thing that people are thinking, oh, this might also present challenges in school. And if you think about concussion, it's, of course this would be difficult for school. So the symptoms of concussion, you can kind of break down into four main categories. So physical, cognitive, emotional, and sleep. Uh, physical being headache, issues with balance, dizziness, vomiting. There's some migraineous symptoms, so sensitivity to light and noise. Difficulty with vision in general, blurry vision. The cognitive symptoms are ones that we often think of, so they, they are going to have trouble actually um, even just processing things. They, they, people describe that having a concussion is, is like things are slowed down. You feel like you're in a fog. Um, they, they can have issues with memory as well, but that feeling of being in a fog is, is almost universal to kids with concussion. Um, they can have emotional symptoms, so depression, irritability, anxiety, which either may be primary from the injury or maybe just secondary from having an injury being pulled out of your usual activities. But those can affect your other symptoms and can also make it challenging to be in school. And then finally, you have issues with sleep. And there, there's, there's some new research in this area that there's there may be primary issues with sleep that arise from the concussive injury, but those can make all of these things worse. And so now if you think about this, God, you've got a headache, your brain isn't sort of working clearly, you can't think clearly, you may feel kind of anxious. This it just makes school too much. It's just, it can be a lot to do. And so what I'm hoping to talk about today is to really think about um, just you know, to describe for you the challenges that might arise with a, a child that has a concussion and is trying to go back to school. And what are the things that can help? What are some of the potential accommodations that can improve success? And I think defining success is important here because to me, success is 
being in school in a useful functional way and so that we want to make sure kids are not missing school and we want to make sure that the time that they're in school is going to be efficient for them and helpful for them and then what is the role of the clinician and, and some of you out there listening may not be clinicians but i think understanding how clinicians have a role in this process is important to kind of understanding the success how this can be made more successful um, so Dr. Vavalala, who's here, has several actually ongoing studies looking at return to learn. And, and this is from one of their papers that they published uh, this, just this past year. Um, and so this is showing you, if you, if you see this, uh, the pink states are the early return to play states. And, and so the return to play laws were actually started in 2009 and started in Washington state from Dr. Herring, who you're gonna be hearing from next. And so uh, Dr. Herring was tired of going to places and saying, we shouldn't have you know, kids playing after we think they may have a concussion, and finally said, we need to have a law. And so that Washington state was the first law that had return to play, play laws, and then um, those have now spread across all 50 states. More recently, we're now starting to see return to learn laws. So that initially there was this, well, we have to make sure kids aren't playing when they're concussed. This is really a different shift. This is really saying, we need to make sure that if a kid has a concussion, that someone is doing something to help support them get back to school. And so the return to learn laws are really about schools having a policy. And I'm not gonna talk as much about that today because the truth is there's still a lot of research to try to understand what are the policies that would be useful from a school perspective. And that I'm really uh, coming at this from a medical perspective, but this is just for you to know that this is on the, on the horizon. And so when we think about return to learn, uh, you know, as I said, this is just sort of a stock phrase, return to learn matches return to play. And yet they're actually very different things. So when you think about return to play, uh, the idea with those return to play laws is a safety. And so an athlete who has a concussion, if that athlete then goes back and plays football, they have a risk of getting a second impact. And that second impact could actually be devastating. And so the first law, we first returned to play law, which was based on Zachary Leistad. Zachary Leistad had a subdural hematoma, and there was a concern that he, his first hit may have set him up for a second hit and, and for that devastating injury. Um, at, Return to learn is really a different concept. It's not dangerous for a kid to go back to school with a concussion, um, but that it is a it may be more important in terms of preventing frustration, in terms of ensuring success, to try to temper how that goes. And that it actually, I also think it's important to think about that it is dangerous to take too long to go back. And so if for return to learn, there's a both sort of, there may be some, you know, risk of going too fast, but there's also a risk of going too slow. And I, I, as a clinician, I've seen this where I've seen kids with concussion where they say, well, my doctor said, you have a concussion, you should be out of school for a month, which is clearly not appropriate. And when you're out of school that long, it can actually start a cycle. It can be very hard to catch up. You could actually lose a whole year. And so that's important that we think about how to make, how to make it better for kids and, and that there are actual ways that we can support them getting back to school. So in order to talk about return to learn, we really first have to talk about cognitive rest, which is to say, why do we even um, hold them back out of school at all? And this was, uh, cognitive rest has actually been around for years. Uh, I think it's hard to even trace back to when this started, um, but this is based on a lot of animal studies that have found that when your brain is in an injured state, um, it is not able to tolerate increased metabolic demand. And so an injured brain can't uh, say, oh, I need more energy, I need to get more glucose, I need more blood flow. It's not able to do that. And an injured brain is working overtime to try to heal that injury. And so trying to add more things that could, there's a suggestion that that might prolong recovery. The animal data is actually really mostly about physical activity and not about cognitive activity. Um, but even that, this is all, the pendulum is really swinging and, and this has become less of a focus. And, and I'll explain more, kind of, I'm gonna outline some of that research. But to talk about cognitive rest, it, what, the, what that meant was limiting activities like texting, video games, schoolwork, television, reading. And there became this idea of, of cocoon therapy, which was, it was based on the fact that the guidelines initially said an athlete should be rested until they are completely asymptomatic without sort of a timeline. And, and that is, is changing. But, I want to outline for you sort of the cognitive rest. So the idea of cognitive rest really came out of the, you know, as I said, this animal research, and that just seemed to make sense. Um, but the, there then have been a few studies trying to study, is rest helpful? Um, this is one of the, the ones that looked at rest. And so this is um, Rosemary Moser and, and Philip Schatz, who, who had a, a 
sample of about 50 high school athletes and collegiate athletes. And they, and they said, well, you know, if we prescribe rest, do they get better? Um, and they found they did. Uh, the problem with injury is that in general, um, I, I, Dr. Herring likes to say everyone gets a trophy, uh, which is that with injury, everyone gets better because it, they're already getting better. You're seeing them at a point when they may be starting to improve. And so to really do this research, you either need to randomize people to a treatment or not, or you need to have uh, another injury control. You need to have some way of, of making sure that the change that you're seeing is due to the intervention that you're prescribing. Um, there is a, another study, uh, which was also a, an observational study, not a randomized study, um, that was, uh, this is from Naomi Brown and, and uh, uh, several who are at um, Harvard and the references down there. Um, but they, they looked at a larger data set, so this is about 300 youth. Um, and this was prospective data, but it wasn't randomized. And so they asked people about cognitive activity and what you see in this Kaplan-Meier survival curve is that, and, and this is, uh, the survival curve is into how long it takes them to recover. And they found that those who were reporting that they were doing a lot of cognitive activity, which is this yellow on the side here, the fourth quartile, those, those individuals took longer to the recover. The problem is that this is not randomized. And so if there is a bias in terms of what would make people uh, either report that they were more cognitively active or actually be more cognitively active may also make it longer to recover. And my, my concern is that this may be related to anxiety as a lot of anxiety patients tend to um, be more perceptive about doing work, maybe staying up later, and that may also make them longer to recover. Um, the other thing that as you see on this graph is that we have in that group, there are people that are taking longer than a year to recover, which is far out of the range of normal for concussion. So most youth with concussion, and there's actually, um, this is actually in the new consensus statement, most youth with, re with concussion should be recovered within two weeks and, and out to a, a month, but longer than a month would be far out of the range of normal. And not to say that that doesn't happen, but that there may be other kind of complicating factors going on with that. And so this is really the best study we have looking at rest. And it, and it has really been, it sort of changed the field when this came out. This is from Danny Thomas, who is at University of Michigan. And uh, he actually did a randomized study. It's a fairly small study. It's an N of 88, but he went into um, the emergency room and, and looked at youth and, and young adults and randomized them to either two days of rest or five days of rest. And when you think of that, that may sound like, well, that, that's not a big difference, two days or five days, but he was really trying to find a point that ethically people felt okay with. And, and this was the study was actually done in 2014, published in 2015. And at that time point, people were very worried about the idea of taking away rest because it had been a standard of care for so long. And the really interesting thing about this study is what he finds, which is, is a, a very different Kaplan-Meier curve. And this is a randomized sample. And so he found that those with strict rest actually took longer to recover. That now, to be fair, this is a trend. This difference between these two curves was not significant, um, but it was a small sample and he, clearly did not see any suggestion that more rest was helpful. And he actually looked at, um, in a careful way, looked at several different outcomes. And um, those were all suggesting that actually briefer rest was more beneficial. Um, so to me, it's helpful to sort of frame some of this discussion around uh, cases. And so I thought, even though there may not be clinicians in the audience, had to sort of think about how, uh, how you would need to be supporting youth that are returning to school after concussion. And the, the cases that I present are all around sports injuries. And for um, youth with concussion, I'd say it, most of the uh, injuries are going to be split between sports, recreation, and motor vehicle accidents. And so those are, are really mostly what you're going to see. So I think it's it's easy to sort of uh, frame them around sports. So this is a, a not a, these are all fictional. This is not a true story, but they are based on, on sort of what we usually see. So this is a, a a uh, young lady, Jackie, 15-year-old soccer player, goes up her header and crashes into another player. And that's a really common mechanism for concussion in soccer. Um, and so two days later, she comes into your office and she has a headache, light is hurting her eyes, and sound is hurting her ears, and she's trouble concentrating. And she says, should I go to school? And so this is, this is a situation that happens. And so then it, it, the question that arises is, so when should kids go back to school after concussion? Um, so what, what do the guidelines tell us? Well, the new guidelines that just came out, and this is from the, now the Berlin Concussion Cons Consensus Conference, which most likely Dr. Herring will talk to you more about 
Um, this is a consensus conference that is a specialist that actually take care of professional sports, but has been used for most sports concussion guidelines. And they say uh, cognitive rest does not need to be more than 24, 48 hours. Um, the truth is they may not need any cognitive rest. So some kids with concussion, if they're feeling well, might be able to just get back to school. And that is fine. As I said, going to school is not dangerous. It's about whether they can tolerate it. Um, but then you say, well, okay, so say this girl is not feeling well, it may be good to get, give her at least a few days rest. How do I then get her back to school? Well, the, the, these are not evidence-based, but the sort of clinician guidelines are once you can, once a youth can tolerate 30 to 60 minutes of schoolwork, sustained cognitive activity, but it should be schoolwork, not plain halo. Um, but once they can actually do that, then you can start to think about going back to school. They're going to need to be able to do at least that to succeed in school. And when they go back to school, then you could think about, do you start with partial days? Do you start with longer days? And that depends on whether you think they are going to be able to tolerate that. So a kid who's feeling fine, who does that and is like, that's no problem, you may be able to send them straight back. Um, these are some of the people that are working in Return to Learn, and this is sort of some of the initial kind of Return to Learn protocols that were designed, which were very similar to Return to Play protocols, which you're going to hear from Dr. Herring about next. Um, but it, we're sort of this graded Return to Learn, so slow reintroduction to kind of cognitive activity. Um, and so uh, this is very similar to what I just discussed. So you might start with complete cognitive rest. You don't want a kid playing Halo for 12 hours a day, and this may need to be more. Um, uh, sort of definitive about the, no uh, texting or none of these, but that can be fairly brief. And then it's this sort of reintroduction of cognitive activities, getting back into school. Um, this is another example of um, that sort of graded return to play. And I think it's just important to look at these and to say this is not necessarily evidence-based. This is right now still based on people's clinical experience um, and that there's no need to say each step has to be 24 hours or all, it really can be sort of tailored to the to the individual athlete or youth. Um, this is what was in the actual consensus statement from Berlin. So this they held the conference in October, but actually this was just published about a month ago. Um, what you will note is actually there's still fairly limited detail. This is the first time that returning to school has been mentioned in the consensus conference. So this was a a big deal that they included this. It was a recognition that getting back to academics is valued and is important. I mean, as you can see, it's the same idea of we slowly start with a small amount of cognitive activity and get them back into school. But there is no, there's still no timeline here. Um, and that's uh, somewhat intentional because they say it may be different for different kids. Um, so this is a second case study. So Mac, again, names all made up. A 19-year-old football player is a helmet-to-helmet -helmet collision, um, and he's passed out for a minute. And it's now a week later, he's in your office. He's back to school, but he's like, I can't pay attention in class. I feel like everything's moving slowly. I took a test, and I think I flunked. I like didn't finish. Uh, what should he do? So the first thing to think about is that when you're seeing a kid with concussion, you want to think about who are the kids that are going to have more trouble in school. And of course, those are the kids that either have a worse concussion, and which we usually define by they have more symptoms, um, or who were not doing well in school to begin with. You know, so if you didn't have that much reserve, once you have a concussion, that's going to be that much harder. So kids with ADHD, kids with a learning disorder, those are the kids that you really need to think about making sure that they're going to have supports when they go back to school. And then the next question is, well, what kinds of supports are useful? Well, some of this is dependent about which symptoms they're struggling with. Um, but for most kids, um, they're going to have headache. They're going to have difficulty concentrating. Uh, and for a headache, having frequent breaks where you can kind of stop doing some things, you can walk around, you can relax, that can be helpful. For difficulty concentrating, it may be things like extra time for tests and not doing standardized testing, one test per day. Uh, sleep issues, they may benefit from having a late start. They may need a little bit more time to sleep. Their sleep may be less efficient. Um, if you have a kid with sensitivity to light or sound, you may be able to um, affect uh, how their environment is. And, and some of those things we you would sort of naturally think of, oh, they might be able to wear dark glasses. Some of them are less obvious. And so one of the things that, that I find is really helpful for youth is early dismissal from class because the loud hallways in a high school can be really challenging if you have sensitivity to sound. A lunch in alternate locations, the lunchroom is also a noisy place and that can be an issue. Okay. 
so the role, there also may be a role for academic supports. And so some of this uh, depends on the school. So your goal is to make attending school easier and, and thus to make it more successful so that they're not missing days. And the days that they're there, they're getting education. Um, but different schools may vary in terms of how what they ask of the parents and the youth in order to, to put those kinds of accommodations into into. Uh, to need a 504 plan, a 504, and, and it, it may also be um, necessary to use an IEP. Um, I need to switch sides. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Sorry, we're having some technical difficulties. Not letting me switch sides. Okay. Can you talk a little louder? Yeah. Just... Well, I can try. Okay. So that brings up, so what is a 504 plan? Um, so 504 is Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, which prohibits discrimination against students with disabilities. And the goal of this is that it helps ensure accessibility of education for youth with disabilities, which includes brain injury. Um, and this is really a, for, a sort of a formalized way of providing support that could be initiated by parents or school um, Essentially, in a very simplistic way, a doctor writes a letter and says, I think this child should be allowed to leave class early so that they are um, not in a loud hallway. And then the school says, okay, that sounds good. And usually there's a meeting between the parents and the school. Uh, the important thing about a 504 is it's not legally binding. The school doesn't have to follow this. But oftentimes that may be, a, it may be enough for the school depending on what the school is able to do. An IEP is legally binding. So an IEP is an individualized education program. This is, is the Individuals with Disabilities Education Improvement Act of 2004. Um, and schools are required, that essentially the, the goal of this act was that schools are required to educate youth in a manner that is tailored to child's disability. So if your child is deaf, they need to make sure that, that, that your child can get education in, in a way that fits them, which may not be through hearing. Um, and if your child has a brain injury, that is included under this act. Um, so this requires that your school, your child is failing. Uh, so this only applies if it's impacting academic achievement. And so an IEP uh, may be more than comes up with concussion because you would have to wait until they failed, really, for most schools. But it is an option, and this may be something that comes up. Um, so the third case study, um, Charlie, this is a 20-year-old woman's uh, crew, crew player who's, uh, she's hit in the head with an aura, which happens. We've had updates of this happens too. Um, and so you're now seeing her a month since her injury, which as you may remember, I said is, is pretty far out for a concussion. Usually most kids would be better by then, um, but she still can't focus. She's failing half of her classes. So what do you do now? Um, because really the urgent issue from my perspective as a pediatrician is she's not going to school or she's failing at school because school is your link to the rest of the world. School is really how you get to be a successful adult. So what do you do with a youth with prolonged issues with school? So the first thing to think about is that not all concussion is the same. And so you wanna know, now that she's a month out, what are the symptoms that are problematic? And so I, this is a, sort of an area of interest for me, these kids with prolonged symptoms. And fatigue, headache, dizziness, and difficulty concentrating are sort of the top four symptoms that usually persist. Um, so there may be different things that you would think about in terms of exploring for those things. Uh, so for fatigue, they may need a sleep study. It may be that there are still impaired issues with sleep, which might be correctable, or they might need treatment for sleep. Um, for headache, uh, neck evaluation. So kids with a concussion, a concussion is, a, is usually a whiplash injury. And so you can often have a sort of underappreciated neck injury, which can cause recurrent headache and maybe making it harder for that headache to go away. Um, you also want to think about, are they using ibuprofen? Kids who use ibuprofen recurrently can actually have rebound headache and sleep impairments can also affect headache. Um, for kids who have prolonged dizziness, there's a sort of this under... Uh, appreciated um, impairment of the vestibular system that can happen with kids with concussion that may require kind of more focused what's called vestibular rehabilitation and there's specialists in vestibular uh, rehabilitation um, who are um, it's a subspecialty of physical therapy and this isn't available at all institutions but maybe something to evaluate uh, because that can cause prolonged issues with balance and dizziness difficulty concentrating I think as, as uh, Molly Fuentes talked about um, neuropsychologists can be very useful in this regard in terms of doing some a more focused evaluation of what is happening when a kid is trying to do cognitive tasks. Um, and they can think more about what they need. There is cognitive rehabilitation as well as an option. Um, and then I think 
one of the big pieces is for many of these kids that have persistent symptoms, there may be a mental health uh, issue that is going on, whether it was pre-existing pre and worsened by the injury or whether it is due to the injury, um, it, it may not matter at that point, um, but those types of issues may need more focused intervention, such as cognitive behavioral therapy, potentially medication. Um, and uh, Dr. Rivera at, and, and his colleagues, Dr. McCarty, have a really nice study where they looked at actually using cognitive behavioral therapy with kids with persistent symptoms and had some uh, very nice benefit. Uh, so ultimately for these kids, they're probably gonna need some support to get back to school, which is likely going to be working with a psychologist or a neuropsychologist or a team of of people. And that is all that I have uh, today. And so I don't know if uh, we wanted to wait for some questions. I think. Yeah. Yeah, sure. We can just dive some. I, I think there was at some point I saw there was a hand up. So I don't know. Questions will pop up in there. Okay. Yeah, so feel free to ask some questions. I know that I saw before someone had a hand up and I was. Uh, Dr. Christman, there was a question that came in yeah. um, through the chat window that said, how common are IEPs and 504 plans for concussion? Well, that is a great question. And the truth is we don't know. And we have a couple of studies where we've been starting to look at that and trying to understand um, most of the people who are looking at these things are also looking in a clinical population. Um, and all kids with concussion aren't seen by doctors or by anybody. Um, so I would say that for kids who are ending up needing to see uh, providers for a longer time, it's very common to have a 504 plan, which is the one that I talked about that is, is sort of more informal, is really just a, like a doctor's letter suggesting these resources. Um, I was trying to think if I have any patients that I have used an IEP with and I can't think of one, it, but it would it it would be a reasonable thing if um, your child was failing. And the thing about an IEP or if, is that as a parent, they you, that is actually the appropriate situation for a parent to request an IEP. That's really how the law is written. Is that as a parent you can say, I want my child to be evaluated because I am concerned that his educational needs aren't being met. And uh, a clinician can't go in and ask for that. And so it, it's a, I think it can be a powerful tool. Okay, so I have a, another question. It looks like, um, so schools are taking two to three weeks to get 504s in place. Is there any research we can hand the school to expedite the process? That is another great question. I, I, um, I think that is something we need to explore more. I think what you're bringing up is an important issue, which is that with an injury, two to three weeks is a long time. You know, and, and I forgot to mention this as I was talking about it, but one of the important things with concussion is this is a temporary, these are temporary accommodations. And so you, we need to be thinking about starting them and stopping them. And, and the truth is schools are not accustomed to that. So the 504s and the IEPs are usually used for people who are gonna have chronic issues with these, these problems. But for a kid with concussion, those two to three weeks are probably the key weeks when they need that support and they may not need it after that. And so um, that may be uh, something to talk about them as a motivator to say, um, you know, this may not be forever. This is probably only for these two to three weeks. Um, but I, again, I think that may be the role for the parent, uh, potentially supported by a provider, either with a letter from the provider or um, uh, some other uh, uh, um, implementation by the provider. And so the next question I have is, if neuropsych is unavailable, is speech therapy a good alternative? And uh, it would sort of depend on the problem that you're talking about, and it also might depend on the speech therapist and what their training is. I would say usually not. Um, so speech therapists uh, are a great option um, if you also want to evaluate uh, the sort of neuromuscular control. Uh, speech therapists will also oftentimes are the, sort of the same types of people who may also measure swallowing because they're thinking about sort of the muscular control of speech. Um, and But with concussion, that tends not to be impaired. With the more severe brain injury, that might be impaired. Um, and neuropsychologists 
uh, will often do uh, sort of batteries of tests. So what they usually will do is do, they may do um, what we call pencil and paper tests, uh, but oftentimes those are on computers, but they're, they're usually administering them. And so they're, they're asking a child to do a test and then to say, they would do specific tests that would assess memory um, in several different realms. So there's working memory, which is like, can you keep things in memory? Um, there is, uh, can you hold new things in memory? So for like sort of delayed memory, can you keep something for a longer term? Um, and they would look at these different things. And, and as uh, I think Dr. Fuentes talked about executive function, which is this idea of, of sort of like overarching planning. And they would look at those to say, these are the issues that this individual has. Uh, so there's another question. As a speech pathologist at Harborview in acute care setting, our training is focused in the evaluation and treatment of the continuum of brain injury for patients. So that that may be true that it, that some, and this is I, what I was speaking to, is that different speech therapists may have this training. And so it would be something about asking that specific provider that you're going to be seeing. It may be, it's to me, it's very appropriate to say, I have this patient, is this appropriate for you? And allowing that person to say, yes, I think I have the training to help you with that or not. Because the truth is that there are many places where you're going to have to be creative about what resources you have, or there also just may be that um, uh, sort of the differential training of different people. Someone who works at Harborview where they have a significant amount of brain injury is more likely to be really comfortable with, with uh, managing brain injury. Um, and that was an, another person saying the same thing, that speech therapists in rehab setting are often trained in cognitive therapy. Should I be clicking the buttons when I answer them? No, they should just pop up. Okay. Looks like there's another question here. Yeah, and so someone else noted that a sports medicine provider might be available if a neuropsych is not. And so, um, yeah, at our, so I think it's, it's, as I described, I think it really depends on what your resources are. So like at Seattle Children's, um, concussion is actually managed in several different departments. And that's, that's very common, whereas sports medicine providers uh, are very experienced with concussion. That's something that they do a lot. Um, and they often are very experienced with uh, accessing resources for going back to school because this is an area that has been focused on. Um, in, and actually in the sports medicine department at Children's, there also are neuropsychologists in the same way that there are neuropsychologists in rehabilitation medicine. And I will, I will say that neuropsychological testing is very expensive and is not covered by insurance. And so it is often not a great option for families. When you ask the school to do an IEP, they are required to do the testing themselves. Um, but it is also a challenge because this, you know, this act, the, ID, the IDA Act of 2004 was put into place without any funding. And so the schools are tasked with trying to meet this demand without having a lot of funding to do it. So neuropsychological testing may not be available and there may be other options to get, to get those types of resources. And it also may be, um, you know, as a, as a primary care pediatrician that you may be able to have that role. I, you know, I think that um, uh, understanding, you can also ask more focused questions to understand more where are the areas that a child is failing. I think one of the other things, and I don't know if I mentioned this, is that um, oftentimes, and I've seen a lot of kids that will express, I feel like my memory is not working, um, that could be due to uh, sleep, or anxiety, um, so that when when you are not feeling well uh, because you are not sleeping, you actually your memory is not working well when you are not sleeping. You are not encoding things. You are not um, able to retrieve them as well. Um, you're actually not learning as well when you have not slept as well as you're not able to retrieve them. Uh, when you have anxiety, you also may not be able to 
pay attention. And so you may never actually put that new information into memory. And so people experience it as an issue with memory, um, but it may be other things as opposed to memory. And so that it may be that you start with treating the sort of obvious low hanging fruit, trying to improve their sleep and, you know, decrease their stress and slowly try to get them back. And it may not, you may not need neuropsychological testing. I don't think it is worth it for people to do thousands of dollars worth of testing in order to get back to school. Um, so there's another question. How are pediatricians in the community being educated regarding resources for concussions and appropriate referrals that the child will need? This is another great question. Um, so uh, as you probably know, pediatricians are asked to be specialists in a large range of topics and TBS, TBI is one of those, um, especially concussion. I think there's been a recognition that the you know, pediatricians are on the front lines in terms of being the point person in, in helping a child get back to school. Um, the, as of right now, I don't know that there are required modules and certainly um, most of that comes from uh, providers wanting that education, but I think that is one of the ways that that has been done is actually by educating parents. Because I think as you educate parents, you can then, they can actually go to the teacher and say, well, I heard about this. Can you tell me more about that? I think there, there also will be from the other side in terms of educating clinicians. All right, so it looks like that is um, all of our questions for now. If you have uh, other questions you think of later, um, you can uh, still post those on there. and We'll make sure that we follow up with Dr. Crispin so that we can get your uh, questions answered. Um, great information uh, that you gave for us today. I know my daughter had a, a concussion a while back and we were lucky enough to have a school that worked with us and we, implement, we were able to implement a number of those protocols um, because they were willing to work with us on that. So, um, we just need to be able to educate people and how people learn about it. So, um, all right, we're going to take another break um, for a few minutes. We are coming back at 2.10 with our next speaker, Dr. Stan Herring. So um, we'll see you at 2.10.